Hi, this is Bill Watkins. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about marriage, going to different passages that have to do with marriage. We've been in Genesis chapter 2. We've been in Matthew chapter 19. We've been in Ephesians chapter 5. We've been in 1 Peter chapter 3. Today, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, to something that's not easy to talk about, but something that needs to be talked about. We'll start in verse 1. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, there's a great way to start, isn't it? I I want you to think about it. Paul is writing an answer to questions that were put in letters and actually given to him. And what you have is like one side of a cell phone conversation. You're hearing his answers. You're not hearing their questions. But it's obvious from the answers what some of the questions are. And one of them had to do with the relationship of a man and his wife. And he says it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Doesn't that seem to be absolutely opposite of what God says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 when he said, when he said it's not good for the man to be alone? These are not opposites because if you read further into it, you'll find out what Paul is actually talking about. You see, There's persecution that has already started in Corinth, and it's getting ready to get worse. There are going to be families who are going to be sacrificed to the lions and others, animals, wild animals. There are people who are going to be threatened with their lives because of their faith in Christ. And what he's saying is that given the present distress, and you'll see that later on in the letter, he says, I say this for the present distress, that it would be better for you not to be married. Now, here's the point. It would be one thing if somebody put a sword to your throat and said, curse God, or else we're going to cut your head off. That would be one thing. But what if they put that sword to your wife's throat or your husband's throat? It would be a whole different level of temptation. And what about this? What if they put the sword to the necks of your children and said, if you don't curse Christ, we're killing your children? Isn't that going to be a higher level of difficulty than it would be if it was just your life by itself? That's what Paul is talking about, that it would be better not to be married when the distress that's coming comes to you. But he goes on, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Here's the point. There's something worse than the difficulty that's going to come. If you have to choose with your children, you have to choose with your spouse. The more difficult and horrible thing would be to commit sexual immorality. He says, that would be worse. So don't do that. He says, marry. The lowest common denominator for marriage, sexual relationships. That's not the highest idea of marriage, but it is an important idea about marriage. Now listen, he says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourself to prayer and then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Here's what he's saying. When we got married, we gave ourselves away to each other. And it's not something to withhold. Never use the sexual relationship as a bargaining chip in your marriage. Instead, make sure that this is a gift that you keep giving because you gave yourself away at marriage you continue to do that. doesn't mean that you can force your spouse to have sexual relationships with you. It means that we give ourselves away. It's not about who's in control. It's about what we did when we first got married. And then he says, don't deprive each other. He's talking about the sexual relationship. And then he gives an exception. He says, except it be for a time uh, and by mutual consent and then get, come back together again. Uh, and he says, give yourself to prayer in the meantime. I can think of several times where you might do that. Sometimes after a child is born and things are difficult, it might be important to agree with each other that for a period of time that we won't have a sexual relationship. Maybe, maybe it would be the same thing in the discipline of children as they get older and you both have terrible disagreements about how you ought to go about disciplining that child. Maybe for one night or maybe more nights, you say, tonight, instead of let's having a sexual relationship, let's avoid that and pray. And then in the morning, talk about what we need to do. And it's surprising how that can make a difference in your life. 
But the point is this, that if you're withholding sexual relationship in a marriage, it needs to be by mutual consent. It needs to be by a specified time. You need to make sure that you're going to get back together again and work things out. Otherwise, you can't have God's approval on this. As long as you live, you're going to be sexual creatures. As long as you live. So, do it God's way. Thanks for watching.